Good morning, everyone. Um, it gives me great pleasure this morning to present the winner of the Raymond Lindemann Award for 2009. As you may or may not know, the award is given for an outstanding paper in the aquatic sciences to a young author, um, in this case defined as younger than 35, for all of those who were wondering if you're still young. Um, and the paper had to have been published within the last two years. So the winner of the 2009 Lindemann Award is Dr. Alexandre Poulain uh, for his article entitled Potential for Mercury Reduction by Microbes in the High Arctic, which was published in 2007 in Applied and Environmental Microbiology. And this paper was um, part of the, the PhD research that uh, Dr. Poulain conducted at the University, uh, Université de Montréal uh, under the tutelage of Dr. Marc Amiot. So just to summarize very briefly, uh, Dr. Poulain's study found for the first time that microbes endemic to the aquatic environments in the Canadian High Arctic have the potential to affect the toxicity and mobility of heavy metals like mercury through the expression of mercury's resistance genes. That's a very brief summary. I'll let uh, Alex present to you the, the basis of the paper in his, in his talk. Um, but before I hand things over to Alex, I would like to read just some of the comments of the review committee for the, uh, for the Lindemann Award. Poulin's paper represents um, or presents a very complete story that makes a convincing case for a new and unexpected mechanism of microbially, mi microbially mediated mercury reduction in polar regions. The combination of molecular work, field work, and modeling represent a dedicated effort to obtain a complete story in one very readable paper. Because of climate change and warming in the Arctic and the serious issues of trace metal contamination across the Arctic Sea, this paper is an important one. Comments from the faculty of 1000, for which this paper has already been selected, suggest that the study is already changing our ideas about how mercury gets into the food chain. So I would like you to uh, help me welcome Dr. Poulain to the stage and to accept his award along with uh, Carlos. There he is. <laughs> It is my great pleasure and honor to present Alex Poulain with the Raymond Lindemann Award for the outstanding paper in aquatic sciences by a young science, scientist for his paper on potential for mercury reduction by microbes in the high Arctic, published in Applied and Environmental Microbiology. Thank Congratulations. Well, good morning. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here, and, and um, thanks, Beatrix, for this very nice introduction. I uh, would like first to thank ASLO, the awards committee members, and uh, the chairs to, uh, for believing that this paper was worth of this year's Lindemann Award. Um, uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an honor and quite a humbling experience considering the scientists who previously received this, this award. So first of all, I'd like to thank my co-author who uh, provided me with the tools and the, and, the, and the guidance to start to address the role of microbes on mercury cycling at high latitudes. It has been a fantastic experience and, and I can only hope that as my career progresses, I will be, uh, I will be able to work with such a fun team of, of scientists. So in the remaining time of this talk, I will just try to tell you a short story of mercury in the high Arctic. Um, mercury is the only metal to be liquid at room temperature. Uh, it is a soft metal with a great affinity for thiol groups, which actually is the base of its toxicity. Three forms of inorganic mercury are environmentally relevant, from uh, the divalent to the elemental state. Um, two forms of organic mercury are naturally occurring in the environment are, and are particularly toxic, uh, methylmercury and dimethylmercury. Um, mercury is volatile, mostly in its uh, elemental form, which contributes to its dissemination throughout the planet from a single point source, whether it be an incinerator or a power plant, mercury will travel, will travel over long distances, thus far uh, reaching uh, pristine uh, ecosystems. 
Mercury has seven stable isotopes, and I'm just hinting at this today. Uh, this is a fascinating field that is actually extremely active, uh, namely with the great progresses, the great analytical progresses that now allow us to, to uh, observe mass dependent and independent Mercury fractionation. So we're quite far from, from having this uh, routinely analyzed, but this provides hope for the development of, of tools to better track the pathways and transformation of Mercury in the environment. And what makes mercury so special and fun is that it can undergo reduction, oxidation, methylation, and demethylation uh, via abiotic and biotic transformations. So um, one became aware of the terrible bioaccumulative properties of organic mercury species uh, after the dramatic poisoning event occurring in the mid and to late 50s in Japan and Minamata, as well as in Sweden and in Iraq. And, um, the link between inorganic mercury and methyl mercury was made uh, uh, 40 years ago in 1969 by a paper published in Nature by Jensen and Jenilov which actually tell us that mercury is indeed methylated in aquatic ecosystem. Uh, this, has somehow, this is somehow related to the activity of, of, of the biological component of this ecosystem and, um, and occurs under anaerobic condition. Forty years later, mercury is still the focus of extremely active research, and I just highlight, highlight here a paper by uh, Jeffrey Schaeffer and Francois Morel published in Nature Geosciences two weeks ago, just to, uh, just to underscore the fact that, that ex exciting research is, extreme, is still going on, obviously, on the topic of mercury methylation, which still remains uh, unelucidated. So why is, is mercury the topic of, of research? Because it is a major concern for government and, uh, and governmental agencies because of the health to, public, uh, to, the, to the public. And it is still the, the, the number one contaminant in terms of the number of advisories for fish consumption published in, in North America. And what I put here is just a map of mercury deposition um, uh, over the, the northern hemisphere. And even though developed countries are, are, are trying to curb their mercury emission, which is very encouraging, developing countries whose uh, energy production is massively relying on, on fossil fuel combustion contributes to emit great amount of mercury in the atmosphere. And so why does this matter for Arctic ecosystem? Well, because, uh, because of the convergence of air masses, which transport mercury poleward, and uh, the residence time of mercury in the atmosphere ranges from six months to 12 months, during which it's oxidized, and under its oxidized form reaches the surface of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Combined to this, there is a very peculiar phenomenon discovered uh, 10 years ago by, by a team of, of Canadian scientists, which is uh, called mercury depletion event. And it occurs during polar sunrise. It is associated with, with the sea salt and the brominated component of the sea salt that acts as, as, as oxidant uh, upon photochemical reactions. And we observe a, a rapid, transient, and quasi-complete depletion of the pool of atmospheric mercury. And you observe a wash-off of the mercury that is present in the atmosphere Sphere that gets deposited at the surface of, 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 of snow. And, and even though some part of this mercury is getting um, evaded back to the atmosphere, there is a need to understand what is the post-depositional -deposi fate of this, uh, of, this, of this mercury, especially considering now the increasing uh, uh, commercial exploitation of northern resources. It becomes, it becomes important to be able to provide tools for, for policymakers and legislators to, to uh, develop sound and sustainable uh, strategies of development of those, of those resources and potentially develop bioremediation strategies. So I was mostly interested in, in redox transformation because they can, one, alter the pool of mercury that is methylable, that leads to the production of the neurotoxin and, thus, and then being uh, bioamplified, but also because it controls the formation of the elementor mercury, which is the volatile form that can thus leave the ecosystem via evasion. And so this work took place on the beautiful island of Cornwallis Island in the Canadian High Arctic. And the paper studied today is part of my, of, of my uh, PhD thesis. And, and I, 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 the, goal of my, the goal of my graduate work was to actually compare uh, boreal and Arctic ecosystem during winter time. And from this Arctic experience, this paper is part of a series of three other papers that looked at the, the distribution and the redox transformation of mercury at high latitude. And, and first, I just would like to set the stage for the study. 
And because the Arctic, the Canadian Arctic is a, is a, is a mix of islands, it was important to us first to actually try to characterize the distribution of, of mercury uh, inland, uh, with inland uh, freshwater and coastal marine system. And so we, thanks to the, thanks to the fantastic skills of, of Newfoundland helicopter pilots, we were able to uh, sampled within a day throughout Conway Island over 150 kilometers um, uh, for total mercury in surface, in surface snow. And what we observed is that actually over sea ice, the total mercury level were the highest. And most of this mercury, over 80% of the, of the mercury found in coastal system was bound to particles. So, I, because, because the snow accumulation is a very dynamic system, both physically, uh, chemically, and physically, and uh, biologically, sorry, it, it, it was important to actually try to understand what's going on with depth. Because, as you may know, uh, snow accumulation is, per, is continuously undergoing metamorphism and transformation. And this will affect the distribution of uh, biological and chemical uh, uh, component of this, of this uh, snowpack. And so as you can see here, even though over uh, lake ice, the pattern is quite, is quite straight, over sea ice, you can see uh, an increase by, by two order of magnitudes of the, of the total mercury concentration. And this is most likely related to the fact that because of this snow metamorphism occurring within the snow accumulation, the mercury that is actually associated to particles settles down the accumulation and is accumulated uh, at, uh, at this location. So then I just wanted to see, well, what's going on during snowmelt over this, you know, this transect, and, and what is the potential for the ecosystem to get rid of this mercury? And here I just present you data that, 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 that are actually um, uh, characteristic of the photo reduction, photo reduction experiment, because uh, mercury is photoredox active. And what you can see here, as, if you will, as a proxy of its capacity to leave the ecosystem, um, we can see yeah, it's the rate of mercury reduction. And as you can see, the rate dramatically decreases as salinity increases. And so here's the, the set, I think the stage is set for this. And so the chemistry suggests that polar marine coastal systems are more likely to be sensitive to mercury contamination. And the question I had was, well, do we see a biological response to this mercury stress? And, um, microbes have actually a fantastic way to alter the chemistry of their environment. And I focused on, a, on an operon that is called the Mer operon, which is a sequence of gene coding for mercury uh, uptake, binding, and transformations. And transformation can be the demethylation, which is first the degradation, the destruction of the methyl mercury, and then the reduction, which is the transformation of inorganic divalent mercury to volatile elemental mercury. And the focus of this work was, this, uh, was a G encoding for the mercury reductase, the mer A, which is actually uh, the core enzyme of this, of this operon. So first of all, I, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to make sure that we were working with, with microbial populations that were endemic to uh, or characteristic of polar uh, ecosystems. And we sampled biomass from uh, epiphytic community thriving on, on sea algae, and so we went to collect uh, we went to collect uh, you know, microalgae thriving in the sea ice leads during the, during the ice break off and some typical microbial mats thriving on the, on the coast. And so as you can see here, and I'm just going to go briefly through this, uh, in, in red and blue we covered the, the, the diversity of, of gram-negative proteobacteria and cyanobacteria, and as well as gram-positive organism. And, and in green is highlighted, uh, highlighted the clones that are coming from, from gene bank, and as you can see, most of them are uncultured, just underlying the fact that the diversity of microbes that are sacrophile or sacrotolerant adapted to cold environments remains quite, uh, quite uh, unknown. So then we went on and tried to uh, look for those genes uh, characteristic of the mercury reductase, and uh, we had to develop, uh, we extracted genomic DNA and total RNA, and as you, as you may know, working from environmental sample is, is quite a hard task, especially when we try to amplify, uh, amplify genes of environmental relevance. And uh, we had lots of non-specific bindings of our primers, and we had to just develop a strategy to actually first amplify uh, a 1250 base pair, and then use this as a template to amplify a much smaller fragment of 300 base pair roughly that is coding for the, for the core of the mare A. And following this, we just generated a clone library encompassing the, the diversity of mare genes and their transcript in Arctic ecosystem. So 
The fact that the genes were present was not that surprising because bacteria have very smart ways to transfer information. And, you know, they can transfer virulence factor, they can transfer the antibiotic resistance, and they can also transfer uh, mercury resistance uh, genes via what, what's so-called transposon, which is a very, very cool way to transfer genetic information from, one, from an organism to the other. What was really cool, however, is that we actually found the transcript, that those genes were expressed in the, uh, in the Arctic environment. So I think this graph is, this graph is, is, I find this graph particularly interesting because it really put things into perspective. So this represents the diversity of our uh, DNA and RNA clone libraries, both for sea ice and coastal lagoon. Each color or patterns represent a type of sequence. And as you can clearly see here, the diversity of the genes present in an environment is not reflecting what is actually expressed. And this is something that, is, that I think needs to be kept in mind when one wants to actually address the role of, of microbes or when one tries to go fish for genes in the environment. There is a need to understand uh, this, what's happening at the, transcriptional, at the transcript level and even further at the protein level, obviously. So, um, Metagenomics has been providing fantastic tools, reconstituting, reconstituting whole genomes, providing us with a wealth of information pertaining to the metabolism of this microbe. Uh, and, and transcriptional analyses are actually quite common when working with pure culture or, or simple co-culture using, for example, microarrays. But I believe that uh, metatranscriptional analyses from environmental sample are quite, uh, are quite challenging still because namely of the overwhelming dominance of non-coding ribosomal RNA. And, and, but I trust that it's seems that it's, 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 it's moving very fast, and I'm looking forward to see actually uh, soon um, uh, paper, papers detailing this, this type of, of studies at, the, at, the, at a much bigger scale. So from this, we felt that we had, we had quite some, some evidence and some, some right to try to put this into perspective. Of course, we didn't, we didn't have pure culture, and we didn't associate it, unfortunately, a type of gene to a particular organism that we could you know, select for and then work with. And so what we did is that we used a modeling approach. And uh, we just wanted to see how this process could be important and, and, and what would be the role of the microbial component of, uh, of, um, of the Arctic in terms of, of redox transformation of mercury. And I've been mostly, uh, you know, we, we have been doing in situ incubation experiment looking at photoreduction and photooxidation of mercury. And I just wanted to see how they can compare how biology can actually stand up against those photochemical reactions, which are uh, often known or thought to be the, the one ruling the, the redox chemistry of mercury. And we tried to use a, a very simple model using the Stella, Stella software, which was extremely, extremely user friendly to, to, uh, to, um, to, to um, develop. And we used a very conservative approach. So thanks to, uh, thanks to the, um, uh, starting from the, our total cell count, we assumed that only one to five percent of the cells that were in our sample were physiologically active. From uh, this one to five percent of the cells, only one percent were actively expressing mercury resistant genes. And uh, from this, you know, pool, they were only reducing mercury to 1% of the rate that were actually observed under laboratory condition. And this just underscores and tells you how little we know of in situ expression of those, of those genes and how actually the protein, which is what really matters, is running under low temperature conditions. And here's what we, here's what we, we obtained. And so as you can see on the top graph here, which represents the surface data, of course, when you increase the, 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 the percentage of cells that are, that are active from 1% to 5%, there is a great increase of the, of the pool of bioreduced mercury, but clearly, even under those conditions, there is a great contribution from the biological component of the ecosystem. And as, uh, as um, uh, we go deeper in the water column, and an oceanographer will forgive me to present the water column that is only 15 meters deep. This is probably my, my limnological background speaking here, but anyway, the, the, the model speaks the same when you consider the whole, the whole mixed layer. Uh, actually, because of the, the decrease in light intensity at depth, uh, the microbes are poised to actually rule the, the, the redox cycle of mercury or its reduction uh, um, as soon as the photic zone and the, where photochemical where photochemistry is active is, is passed. So, just to I'm concluding now, and, and here's what we knew of the of the mercury cycling in the Arctic. Mercury is oxidized, gets deposited onto aquatic uh, ecosystem. It can be photochemically uh, reduced back. 
uh, transformed by microbe into methyl mercury gets into the food web are being demethylated again by bio uh, by uh, photochemical transformation. But we just show that actually microbe has to be taken into consideration, and they are using MRA. But I just mentioned earlier on that that there are other genes coding in this operon, which has which is MRB, which actually codes for the for the uh, methyl mercury lyase. And we didn't we didn't look for those genes, but it's it's expected that they are that they are present up there. And in that case, there is a potential for microbe to not only alter the redox chemistry of mercury, but clearly detoxify the environment and get rid of the, of the methyl mercury. And this slide also shows you here, uh, actually, that I put microbes in the atmosphere. And I think this is a very, very exciting field that is, that is being developed to looking at the biological component of the atmosphere as possibly uh, uh, altering the redox state of mercury. And I won't, won't go further into this, but this is something to keep in mind for further, for further research. And, uh, and then that's, that's fine. And just um, let, me, let me take a few seconds to actually uh, acknowledge uh, two people. As a young scientist and as my career progressed, I've been blessed to interact with both Mark Amio, who was my, who was my PhD advisor, and Tamar Barquet that I met when I first did my master's at the experimental lakes area. And they have been providing fantastic guidance throughout, throughout the, 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 early, the early years. And I am extremely grateful to them for this. Uh, all my friends who actually accompany me to the, to the field, uh, Arctic field work is quite demanding and I've been blessed by working with fantastic people. And uh, my colleagues at, uh, uh, in the University of Montreal and, and now currently in the Newman Lab at MIT for extremely stimulating discussion and all the funding. And thank you very much for your attention and thank you again for this fantastic work.